Well, hello and welcome everyone to the podcast. We have with us special guest, Mr. Dave Champion, who's going to be navigating us through the minefield of common law trusts and all the intricacies and bringing it down to a digestible level so that all of you can feel comfortable about the process in your lives going forward. Now, before we get started, please do like and subscribe to the channel as it does help it grow. Even if you're watching our show and you're not subscribed, you'll be able to get daily notifications as these videos come in so that you'll be up to date with the most timely information. Now, let me read from uh, Mr. Champion's background verbatim. <clears throat> Dave Champion is a former Army Ranger with a law enforcement background specifically in the private sector. Dave is a businessman turned journalist, having hosted his own radio and TV shows ranging from 2000 to 2018. In addition to being a physiologist with a doctoral degree in political philosophy, Mr. Champion has an extensive background in legal studies. He served as a legal consultant on state and federal regulatory matters, as well as a constitutional law advisor. Dave is also a public speaker, having lectured on numerous subjects, including the U.S. Constitution, the Second and Fourteenth Amendment, as well as the Sixteenth Amendment, the history and proper limited application of the income tax, government relations, and human physiology. Dave is a formal martial arts instructor with a renowned firearms tactics and the use of force instructor. Dave's first book is groundbreaking and widely acclaimed, quote, Income Tax Shattering the Mess, which he was gracious enough to give me a copy and I'm still reading through it. Uh, Dave's second book is based on years of research called Body Science, the New 21st Century Understanding of the Human Body and its Working Components. In the mid-1990s, Mr. Champion interned with one of the nation's most knowledgeable common law trust advisors. Upon her retirement, Dave began providing common law trust and serving as a trustee for those seeking the protection of a common law trust. Dave spent 15 years educating Americans about the benefits of common law trust, providing indentures and serving as trustee. With all that said, Mr. Champion, thank you for your time. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. I appreciate being here. Oh, it's an honor, believe me. Um, so with so many people looking uh, you know, for how to protect their assets and minimize their, their liabilities and exposure, there's a high interest in learning more about these specific trusts. In your bio, you did mention you are one of the top sub, uh, top experts on respected subjects. So let's start simple, Dave, and build. Um, what is a common law trust? In order to in order to describe what a common law trust is, we have to juxtapose it against what a statutory trust is. So whether we're talking about a statutory trust or a common law trust, they have quite a number of features that are absolutely parallel. However, statutory trusts are created by laws that our elected representatives have passed in the legislature, and they are creatures of the legislature. So if the, for instance, if you had a statutory trust and tomorrow the legislator, legislature repealed all of those laws, you would no longer have a trust. That is not the case with a common law trust. Common law trusts are based on common law factors that have existed in our tradition, our history, and the judicial landscape in the United States for the last 200 and more than 230 years. The, the, the common law traditions that are used to create a common law trust existed back in the days of the colonies and have moved forward. Um, the, if I were to clarify the core of a common law trust. What it is, is it is a legal entity established by each particular party in the trust contracting into that role. Okay. Now, it's important to understand that one of our unalienable rights is the right of contract. And the U.S. Supreme Court has said, you know, 80, 90 years ago, that the right of contract is an unalienable right that cannot be altered by the government. The only restriction on that is the right of contract does not extend to criminal activities. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in a common law trust, we don't ask the legislators or the legislature for permission to create an entity. And it is not beholden to the state or federal government. It is created under common law precepts and it exists simply because Americans have the right to establish those on their own without involving the government. Is that succinct and clear? 
makes sense to me. So you mentioned a minute ago, rightly, that there are some similarities between a common law trust and a statutory <clears throat> trust. So diving into that a little bit, what are the major differences in your estimation? The major differences or the major similarities? The differences. Uh, the differences are that all statutory creatures um, are, I won't say all, most statutory creatures are governed by what's called public policy law. In other words, if the state legislature, the, the legislature, they are responsible for enabling this to exist, then they have a legal, they're, I guess we could say colloquially, colloquially uh, that they are the parents. And so they have the ability then to um, discipline and limit the behavior of their children, which would be a corporation or a trust, so forth, if it's created under their authority. Okay. So common law trusts don't owe anything. I think that's a really important concept. They owe zero to the government for their existence. Therefore, they are not regulatable by the government unless or until they choose to engage in some sort of conduct, the conduct of which may be regulatable by the government. So for instance, let's say a common law trust decided to get into the alcohol distilling business. Okay? then the alcohol distilling aspect would be regulatable, but the trust itself is not. So the people who uh, decide to create a common law trust, they literally, I mean, and I served as trustee for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trusts over a 15 year period. Um, the interaction between the trust, the trusts and the government over that period of time was exactly zero. Yep. Um, and, and that, I think, is one of the major attributes of a common law trust. You can really, I, I think most of your audience would agree, we sort of live in this construct created by our society as a construct created in great part by government. So mm -hmm. what happens with a common law trust is here's this, this societal construct that, that to a great extent is created by government and its laws. The common law trust goes, nope, not me. I'm going to be over here. I'm not going to be in this realm anymore. Um, and, you know, a lot of people who pursue things like common law trust really have a disdain for government. And while I have a healthy distrust of government, I do not have a disdain for government. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, because I have a healthy distrust, which they created, by the way, um, that's not where I started in life. Um, but because I have a healthy distrust, anything I can do to exist outside that construct we just talked about, I'm going to do it. And that's one of the beauties of common law trust is that if, for instance, a person creates a common law trust to conduct a business, right? Most businesses are highly constrained by public policy law, common law trusts are not. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was uh, really well said. So this, this next question may seem obvious, but I have a feeling there's some, there's more nuances to it than maybe people realize. And that is, is a common law trust for everyone? No, uh, common law trust is a tool. Okay? Um, if common law trust were for everyone, I, I think shows like you and I are doing right now would be much more prevalent because everybody would be rushing to them. Right. Um, they're not. They're not. Um, for instance, I gave the distilling alcohol example. For somebody to create a common law trust to distill alcohol would not be productive. Uh, you know, uh, there's an old adage, you know, it, it, if, if everything on the lake is a duck, you might want to look like the duck. <laughs> and, and that would be true of something that's highly regulated, like distilling alcohol or importing alcohol and so forth. So there'd be absolutely zero benefit to a common law trust. Um, it also would not be a tool that, oh, what would be the right term? normies <laughs> people who buy into the establishment hook line and sinker and think that's the way life should always be lived as according to the establishment um common law trust would not be for them because it would put them outside their comfort zone uh but mm. for people who believe in personal liberty for people who do not want to live in that that system that we described and perhaps they own a business or they just want to protect property what have you but they don't want to do it with the permission of government. They want to do it the way our ancestors did it, the way our great great grandfathers did it, the way the founding fathers did it. They want to do it that way. 
in that case, the common law trust is very attractive and people might consider pursuing it. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, so with that in mind, for those who it is appropriate or applicable, what, what assets would you specifically put into a common law trust? You can put any assets. First of all, we should start when we say you, we're talking about somebody who in trust law is called the grantor. Okay. Right. And the, the grantor, I'm going to give sort of the everyman version. It's not the legal definition. The, the grantor is the person who says, hey, I've got this property over here, and I think it would be really nifty to put this property over here in a trust. Okay. Um, that's the grantor. Okay. So what kind of property can the grantor put in a trust? Anything. Um, they can put real property in a trust. They can put personal property in a trust. They can put intellectual property in a trust. There is literally no limitation as to what can be held in trust. If it's Perfect. if it's if it has the word property after right, we have tangible property, personal property, real property, intellectual property. If it's got the second word as property, you can put it in a trust. That's great because that's a very wide net, as you know. Um, yes. So many groups promote, David, having common law trusts, also, as you know, called an irrevocable private express trust. Many say that you need to get an EIN for the trust. This trust EIN allows them uh, to open up a trust bank account. But doesn't getting an EIN make the trust known to the IRS? The trust would no longer be private, right? You know, the concept of private is is malleable. What is private to one person does not have the same meaning as private to another person. Um, obviously, for instance, if, you, if one has a trust that's merely holding property, okay, it doesn't need a bank account. Okay? Let's say somebody's got a antique car collection. So they create a common law trust and they put 35 antique cars in the common law trust. Mm -hmm. There's not even a discussion about an EIN because it's irrelevant. They're not, they're not going to go out in the business world and they're, they're not going to uh, create a bank account, presum presumably. Uh, now, the other side of the coin is, what if they need to open a bank account? Well, there, there are ways to open bank accounts without EINs, um, specifically for trust. As an individual, your odds are pretty damn close to zero of accomplishing that. Uh, but there are there are ways to address that as well. So let's talk about the EIN for a second, because obviously it's a lot easier to walk into a bank and say, here's my trust and here's my EIN. Okay, um, Having an EIN does bring the trust to the government's attention, but it does not, this is critical, does not mean the government's going to crawl up the trust's ass. It doesn't. Um, here's why. Uh, if a person is receiving U.S. source income belonging to a foreign person, which is one of the three classes upon whom Congress has imposed the tax, okay, then that trust would be, common law or otherwise, it would be required to withhold the tax before it pays that U.S. source income, uh, what, before it crosses the border, leaves the country, and goes to its foreign owner. That doesn't matter whether it's Dave Champion, whether it's John, whether it's a common law trust or a statutory trust. The law is clear. If you're, if you're moving U.S. source income that belongs to a foreign person offshore to the foreign person, you need to withhold and you need to file the appropriate tax return and pay it over to the government. So that doesn't matter. So somebody might, a trust might get an EIN because let's say it does that one time in 30 years. Okay. okay. So it needs, a, it needs an EIN for that purpose, yes? Mm -hmm. Does it need an EIN for all the other days of that 10-year period except that one day? No, it doesn't. Um, so th there are methods that I advocate. Um, if a person, if the bank says which is a different issue than needing an EIN, okay, legally speaking, because if a trust isn't engaged in some of the activity we just mentioned, it doesn't need an EIN. But then you go to the bank and the bank says, we're not opening an account without an EIN. Okay. So what they're doing is they're basically extorting you. Okay. Um, they're, they're saying, unless you acquire something that you are not legally required to have, and you furnish it to us, if you, unless you meet our demands, like a kidnapper, unless you meet our demands, then we're not going to open this account. Okay. So obviously that's not legal. Um, but banks, I think it's no uh, shock to your uh, audience that, that banks uh, have an outsized role in society. So mm -hmm. if we think we're going to say to a bank, Here's the law. Do what I say. And the bank's going to go, oh, okay. 
that's not going to happen. But there are ways to protect yourself or protect your trust if the bank acts like a kidnapper and says you will meet our demands or this isn't going to happen. So th there are options is my point. And uh, it's it has to be done correctly. It, every jot and tittle of the law has to be properly addressed because banks and the government love it when people don't do things exactly right because it leaves an opening for them. Right. So with, so with that in mind, David, again, thank you. Uh, so that if I understand you correctly, there is a way to have a, you know, relative private common law trust where there's ways around the EIN with the bank, basically, is what you're saying. Is that right? I don't know if I'd say there's a way around it, <clears throat> but there is a way of protecting yourself or a trust, depending. It could be either one. When right. the bank attempts to extort you into giving them a number that you're not legally required to have, you can correct that on the record. And by doing that, you can protect yourself or your trust. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, um, how does a common law trust work and who is typically involved in the creation and management of said trust? Well, there are a number of trust officers. Uh, the most notable is the trustee. Uh, the way it works in most trusts, and specifically in common law trusts, is that the property granted into the corpus of the trust is held by the trustee in his official capacity as a trustee. So I'm going to use myself as an example for this illustration. If I'm a trustee, the property is held in the name of Dave Champion, trustee for XYZ Trust. Okay. Okay. Um, does that give Dave Champion any personal rights to the property? It absolutely does not. There, there's a fiduciary duty um, that is a part of the trustee's duties. And if the trustee violates those, he can be taken to court. Now, um, who would take the trustee to court? Well, um, the grantor could take the trustee to court if the trustee engaged in conduct that was unethical. Um, also, there's a officer uh, optional position called the protector. Um, and uh, the, the, the only authority that the protector has in a trust is to go after the trustee in court if the trustee um, begins to act in a way that's not commensurate with his fiduciary duties in trust law. Uh, then, so we got the grantor, we've got the trustee, we've got the protector. Then we have something called the unit certificate holders. Um, I think the easiest way for unit certificate holders to understand, I'm sorry, for the for your audience to understand unit certificate holders is they are somewhat analogous to the beneficiary in an insurance policy. Um, the trustee, his obligation, first of all, is, is to the laws of the trust and to the um, dictates of what the indenture demands of the trustee. Okay, uh, his second responsibility is that the the ethics that we talked about a moment ago. But all of that is for the purpose of that property is being held in trust for the unit certificate holders for their benefit. So, let's say a trust, um, the, the grantor specified in the trust that uh, 28 years after the date the trust was created, the trust was going to be liquidated and all the resources of the ass, all the resources held in the corpus were going to go to the unit certificate holders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can see the parallel to beneficiaries of an insurance policy. It is the unit certificate holders are for whom the trust benefits exist. Uh, the benefits inure to them. Uh, but here's a critical component. The unit certificate holders can have absolutely nothing to do with the trust. So, for instance, some people, they will want to, um, a gentleman might come along and say he wants to create a business trust. And he wants his two sons to be the unit certificate holders. But his two sons are in, his, are in the business. He wants to create a business trust, run the, run the business from within the trust. But his two sons <clears throat> are in the business. Sorry, then his, his sons have to make a choice. Well, he has to make a choice. Um, his sons can be unit certificate holders or they can be in the business. They can't be both because if they were operating the business, um, it, they, they would not have clean hands, uh, a legal doctrine. And they could possibly influence the actions of the trust. And in, and in doing so, they would be able to influence their own interests as unit certificate holders. And that is impermissible.
Okay. Um, and lastly, we have something called managing agents. Uh, managing agents are exactly sort of what the name would imply. Um, not everything that goes on in a trust day to day needs the attention of the trustee. In fact, very little ever requires the attention of the trustee. Um, and if it's merely holding property, managing agents sometimes are not necessary. Managing agents are, are typically crucial when a business is being operated with, from within the trust. And the role of a managing agent is to operate either what we might call a CEO of a corporation uh, or a mid-level manager. So for instance, um, in, in trust for which I have sat as trustee, sometimes there were, I'm just going to throw out an example, there were three managing agents and say one of the managing agents, um, he was in charge of the whole shebang for the business. The other two managing agents were his subordinates and their managing agent agreement, because remember, they all have to contract in this, this entire corpus is comprised of people who contract into the structure. Their contracts literally create the structure. Um, so their contracts would limit their authority as managing agents where the primary managing agent would have full and complete control over the business. Did I express that clearly? You did, you did. I was just processing and making some notes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dave, let's back up a second before I go forward because I think this is an important point for, I think for us and for the audience as a whole, it's, it's a whole commensurate thing, obviously. So you're talking about with the common law trust protecting you, like if let's say your uh, trustee or fiduciary owner, uh, you know, is not above board or they try to, you know, pilfer from the trust, any number of scenarios, right? And you would have to take them to court. You're taking them currently to a statutory maritime court. Would this trust in and of itself be outside the court's jurisdiction because they really can't, it's, they can't capitalize on it. Is that right? Well, I'm going to have to take a step back myself sure, of course. and, and say that, uh, you know, the, your average neighborhood court of equity is not an admiralty court. Um, it, it, it is exactly what it says, court of equity. So you, you see in a lot of things where it talks about, uh, at law or equity, we've all heard that expression as we've studied law. Mm -hmm. um, at law refers to the common law, okay? And so courts <clears throat> can function at law or equity, and 99.9999999% of courts today function in, in equity jurisdiction. Um, I don't think Americans here in 2024, if you explain to them how law, which you, as a court views it jurisdictionally as common law, um, the common law is harsh uh, and the common law is unyielding and there are no compromises and something that somebody would say is manifestly unfair and is going to screw up the rest of their life in common law. That's it. You're done. There, there's no question mark. Equity has more flexibility. So I think Americans today are more amenable to uh, equity jurisdiction of the courts. OK, so with that handled. Um, yeah. The, the court can hear any a court. Your I'm going to say it this way: your ordinary neighborhood court. Okay, I don't want to get into things like you know the various different kinds of federal courts and Article One courts and things like that. Okay, your average regular neighborhood court can handle any controversy that is brought before them between two parties, and the judges judges are no better than anybody else. Okay. Um, sometimes they're sterling, they really know their job, and sometimes they're dumbasses and they don't. So it is important for whoever is going to file on behalf of the trust, whether it's, say, the grantor uh, or whether it's the protector, that they are able, they, they are prepared. They may not have to do it, but they are prepared in their filings to tactfully explain the principles of trust law to a judge who may have no experience with trust law. Now, the good news is when you go to court, um, the fiduciary duty that we discussed uh, concerning how a trustee must act within his role um, as trustee, they're virtually identical between a common law trust and a statutory trust. The, the ethical requirements and the limitations of actions, the boundaries um, for the actions of trustees are damn close to 100% the same between a statutory trust and a common law trust. So my point being, 
that if a, if a judge has some experience with the, the limitations of the authority and the proper conduct of a trustee in a statutory trust, that is immediately understandable if a common law trust shows up in court and says, Your Honor, we need this trustee removed. And by the way, the courts do have the authority to remove a trustee who has uh, violated their ethics, violated the indenture. And I also want to be clear. The indenture lays out the form and structure and purpose of the trust. However, there are many, many, many principles that circumscribe the conduct of a trustee that are not expressed in an indenture. They are simply a matter of common law and well understood. Okay. Thank you. That's That was great. That, that kind of untangled some things. Um, Okay, so can the trust certificate holder be related to the creator of the trust, board of trustees, or the protector of the common law trust? Repeat the question so I make sure I understand it correctly. Yeah, yeah, sure. So can the trust certificate holder, can that be can they be related to the creator of the trust, It'd be a board of trustees, or the protector of that said common law trust? They can definitely be related to the grantor. That's very, very typical. Um, they cannot be related to the trustee, or maybe we should say the trustee cannot be related to them. Yeah, that, mm. That's that's definitely a conflict of interest. That definitely is outside the ethical boundaries. Right. Um, and the, the protector cannot be associated with them because the protector is this, the protector is the, the second most important person to have clean hands. Okay. In other words, the protector should be completely neutral. The protector should be able to judge the actions of the trustee without a bias. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say the protector was the mother of one of the unit certificate holders. Mm -hmm. Clearly there's a bias imputed there. There's no clean hands doctrine. There's no arm's length doctrine there. Okay. So it's important that the protector should be completely non-biased and not have any conflict of interest and stand at arm's length from the unit certificate holders. Only then can the protector go, be, because what you don't want to have happen is this. The protector talks to the trustee, attempts to sort things out. Um, by the way, the 15 some odd years that I served as trustee, I never heard from a protector because I never ever violated the fiduciary duty of a trustee. But for the sake of this, so a protector, and I, I still serve as protector for a couple of trusts. So, what I would do if, if somebody contacted me, the, the grantor, the unit certificate holders, and said, I think the um, trustee is acting outside his fiduciary duty, my first step as protector would be to get on the phone with the trustee and say, this is the concern. Can you explain to me your side of this? Because, John, you know how people are. Not, not everybody's character, characterization is always factual or fact-based, or they might lack a more um, subtle understanding. Okay. So the first thing I would do is I would get on with the trustee and I would say, you know, here's their position. Give me your position. And then if it appeared that there was an ethical issue, uh, a fiduciary duty violation, um, I, I would have a conversation with the trustee and I would ask him for the interest, for the best interest of everybody okay? that he step, he or she steps away from that particular conduct and does not repeat it moving forward. Um, I would ask further that they execute a document that would go to me and would go to whoever the complainant was, stating that they they had agreed to step away from that particular conduct and it would not be repeated. Okay. Boom! We don't go to we don't have to go to a courtroom. Nobody should ever want to go in a courtroom, right? Right. right. Because, because that can be a crapshoot. Yes. Yes. Um, so that would be the first step. If the trustee, if it becomes evident to the protector that the trustee is we'll just say, is aware that the actions are stepping outside his fiduciary uh, envelope and intends to continue, okay? Then a conversation needs to take place between the protector and the complainant, and the conversation needs to become, uh, is, is, does this rise to the level that you want to go to court? Because mm -hmm. if you do want to go to court as protector, I'm the guy who's going to go in and argue. And I'm happy to do that, but you need to decide whether this is significant enough that you want to go to a courtroom. Okay. Um, if they say, absolutely, I want this conduct to stop, then as a protector, on behalf of the trust, the, 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 the trust would actually be the plaintiff and would name the trust as the defendant 
And then I would go in court and argue before the judge why the trustee's actions were inappropriate. And at least speaking only for myself, um, there would be no question that I would uh, make it very clear to the judge with a ton of case law that this action is inappropriate. And the judge would agree and he would order the trustee to cease and desist that conduct. Or if it was flagrant enough and and it was determined the trustee could not be trusted, um, it's extraordinary. It doesn't happen very often. But the trustee can actually be removed by the court, mm. right? And in your in your expertise, you'd also be an impartial observer as well. So you would be more fact based than emotional based, which I would think would weigh heavily. Which is which is critical, and the judge is going to ask about that. Yeah, the judge the judge is going to say, explain why you're here representing this trust, and right. explain your relationship to the various parties within the trust. And if I can say clean hands and arms length, Your Honor, I have no association with any of them. I'm just, I just contracted into the role because they trust me. They, they're aware of who I am and what my history is. So they trust me. Right. He would say, okay, carry it. Let's carry on. Yeah, because you're an independent third-party observer. You have no dog in the fight. Um, so th- thank you, Dave. A couple of follow-up questions to what we just discussed. You were talking about how they can't be related. So the first question would be, in your experience, what are the implications if they are related and do you have a minimum number of trustees that you would recommend a person have on their trust? Okay, a minimum number of trustees is one. <laughs> okay. Um, there's really, there's not a lot of reason, there are some, but they're rare, when it would be, I'm not going to say necessary, we'll say desirable to have more than one trustee. Um, yeah. You know, I guess the, this is this. Let's say your trustee is a person of character and honor. Mm-hmm. Who understands trust law? How would that be better than five trustees with character and honor who understand trust law? Okay. Um, it, it doesn't really bring anything to the table. Now, if you're bringing people in because of, say, I don't mean politics in the Republican Democrat way, but let's say interpersonal politics, you're bringing somebody on board for political reasons. Yeah, you might want to have, you know, let's say there's a there'd be family strife if you didn't make Bob a trustee. Okay, well, then you better have some other then you better have some other trustees. Okay, but again, I for my 15 years of involvement with trusts, um, I I think I can remember out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, I can remember one case where there was more than one trustee. So that's not necessarily important. Uh, you asked a question about um, what happens if they are related. Okay. Right, right. Uh, well, obviously, the trust would not stand up under scrutiny. So if it ever came before a court, the trust, the, the, a judge may, perhaps even likely, rule that the trust is not valid. Okay. And then the property would simply revert to the to the to being the property of the corpus would simply convert to being the property of the grantor, um, and that would be it. And the trust would be no more. Uh, a little bit of an awkward question for me because any trust creator, which is what I was back in the day, mm-hmm. any trust creator who's worth their salt he or she is going to ask the pertinent questions at the point when the, the, the application to create a trust is being filled out. And if anything comes, for instance, I'll just use myself as an example back in the day. If somebody said, well, I said, well, that's impermissible under the doctrine of trust law. And they said, well, this is the way I want to do it. Fine. You're going to need to find another creator. Because while the trust creator is not typically associated with the trust, uh, you, n- normally, you know, you go six months, six years, six decades down the road, nobody knows who created the trust, who the guy was who prepared the paperwork and all that. What they know is the trustee and they know the protectors. So, sure. um, nevertheless, uh, I value my reputation and I would never want a, a trust that I had created that I had worked with the grantors and the other parties to create that corpus. I would never want a court to say, because the creator did not do his due diligence, I strike this trust down. I just find that professionally reprehensible. So, Mm -hmm. and and I I know 
that there are trust creators who don't know their business well. That's not a supposition. That's a fact. But I would like to think the people at the top of the pyramid, the people I trust, the people I interact with, uh, would never, not in a million years, would they allow a trust to move forward with the parties, the parties related who cannot properly be related. Right. So it sounds like, if I'm hearing you correctly, David, proper discernment throughout the trust creation process is critical. Can you repeat that? I said, it sounds like what you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, is that proper discernment during, before, during, and after the trust creation process is critical, including the, the people or persons you bring in as your trustees. Absolutely correct. Um, you may have heard of like uh, putting ceramic coating on a car. Uh huh. Okay. So that, that one guy, uh, the, the guy who owns the car can put ceramic coating on his whole car in like a half an hour and it'll look like crap. <laughs> the, the right. reason that, that we pay people thousands of dollars and our car is there for five or six or seven hours to get it done is because of the color correction and, and the, the decontamination of the paint. Mm -hmm. Then, only then can the ceramic coating be put on correctly. Um, and will, will it provide the outcome you're looking for? It's the same thing with a trust. Only when that color correction <laughs> and the decontamination process is done during discussions to form the trust, only when that's done do you get the outcome that is sustainable that you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, you get what you pay for and don't take shortcuts, basically. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, let me be very clear about this. You get what you pay for. Um, respectful, sure. I'm going to disagree when it comes to trusts. Okay. Um, I have had people mail me trust indentures that they literally pay $10,000 to get a trust. And they, they started to have some questions in their mind at some point. And so they paid me to review the trust documents and they mailed me the trust documents. I read them and I was appalled. Utter crap. Just, just nonsense. All, all sorts of personal philosophy, sometimes religion, all sorts of things that have no, that should never be in a trust indenture because they're not the law, right? And, and mm -hmm. I've read these trusts and some of them were, you know, 65 or 70 percent of crap that does not belong in a trust indenture and that significantly elevates the chance that a judge who's reviewing the trust if it gets challenged for instance mm -hmm. um will say this isn't a real trust indenture this is somebody's nonsense bs and and they'll declare the trust invalid um so uh, what we want is we want everything that needs to be in the indenture to be there and anything that doesn't belong there, you know, it would be like if you and I were doing a, a, a executing a contract, I was going to review something for you. Okay. And suddenly the contract gets into, you know, well, the earth is flat and this and that and the other. I mean, what would that belong in a contract? No, not, not our contract, not the one that based right. on this topic we're addressing. And it's the same thing with common law trust. And whenever the indenture contains a bunch of personal nonsense that doesn't belong there, um, that significantly elevates the chances if it gets challenged, it's going to be declared invalid. So, and, and like I said, I've seen that kind of language in trust where the grantor paid ten, literally ten thousand dollars, ten thousand yeah. dollars that a guy had in, in Microsoft Word on his computer fill in some blanks, spit it out, and, you know, just, it's so irresponsible. Mm -hmm. So unprofessional. Agreed. And I, I should clarify, David, when I said, get yeah, what you pay for, I wasn't necessarily talking about the cost of the trust, but the diligence of picking your team and thinking yes. through the details is what I was referring to. But yeah, you shouldn't have to pay that much. You're absolutely right. Um, so next question I have, David, is how does the trustee know what's in the best interest of the trust? for the benefit of the certificate holders? Well, the trust indenture specifies the purpose that the for which the trust exists. Mm -hmm. um, if there are specific steps that are intended to be taken by the trustee over a period of time to increase the benefit to the certificate holders, such as say investing, okay, that is going to be specified in the trust indenture. However, most is, trusts generally, but most especially common law trusts, the trustees are not experts at, for instance, since I mentioned investing, financial investing. Okay. So in that case, which what would what the grantor 
would want to do and what the trustee should want to have done, and the trustee should advise this during the formation portion, is that a managing agent is appointed who does have those skill sets and who does have the expertise and who does have the track record of include, of increasing wealth through investment, as we mentioned that. Um, so then you would want to bring on a managing agent who in the managing agent agreement would have that task specifically assigned to him or her. And it would be to increase the value of the corpus of the trust in the best interests of the inner certificate holders. Um, I want to be very clear that if the goal of the trust, what the grantor expects to happen five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road, if that is not expressed in the indenture, it's not going to get done because the trustee does not have the authority on his or her own to simply scratch their head and say, well, as you is, I think today mm. I'm going to unilaterally make the decision to do this or that. That's not within the trustee's purview. Right. Now, you can bring in a managing agent and you can open up that description to the point where a whole lot of things are within his or her purview, but that would be the managing agent, not the trustee. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you. Uh, how do you protect the trust from a trustee acting in bad faith? You can't. Um, hmm. Again, it, it's like, how do you stop? If, if you owned a quick mark, how do you stop it from being robbed? You can't. Guy hmm. walks in the door with a gun, sticks it in your face, you're getting robbed, right? The question is, what do you do after that? Okay, so um, this is where the protector comes in. This is where managing agents can be useful. Okay. Um, and of course, we could turn this around and we could say, what happens if a managing agent becomes abusive? All right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your question leads to something that back in the day, I used to always pound during the formation phase when I was talking to the proposed grantor. I would say, you know, if there's any doubt in your mind about the character or, or integrity of the, a managing agent, any of them, if there's more than one, um, of the trustee that you would like to see appointed, uh, which typically that wasn't a problem because back when I used to do it, I, I was probably 99.9% .9 of the time I was their selected trustee. Um, and lastly, uh, the protector. I would say if you have any doubts about the integrity and the honor of these people, they don't belong in your trust. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can only say that during my 15 years, I was unaware of any officer of a corporation, I'm sorry, of a, of a common law trust that took actions that the grantor would have found problematic. So appar apparently the grantors that I talked to all got the message, you know, that you need to have sterling trust in the people that you, you want to see in these positions. Sure. Now, back to your question, though, how do you stop them? Okay. Well, first of all, you have to detect it. So embezzlement, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, companies normally don't understand that somebody over in accounting is embezzling until there's an audit 18 months, 24 months, 36 months down the road. And the auditor go, walks into the, to the CFO's office and says, uh, I think we have a problem. And mm -hmm. then they do forensic accounting and they accumulate the evidence and they go after the person, right? So it, it's much the same in any structure where there are multiple people involved, um, first of all, you have to become aware that somebody's acting inappropriately. Then you have to conduct an investigation, and the courts can help with this, um, mm -hmm. through the subpoena power. If you file an action, then you can use the subpoena power to get the records, um, whether it's an errant uh, managing agent, whether it's an errant trustee, uh, if they refuse to make records available, which would be an immense red flag. Any trustee or managing agent that refuses to make available the non-private records, because, for instance, you wouldn't want to surrender somebody's medical records. But if it's simply business records or, or simply the business of conducting a trust, those should be available to the trustee if, if he or she ever requests them and to the protector immediately. If the trustee or a managing agent says, I hear your request and the answer is no, 
there could not be a bigger red flag waving no, that no. there is a problem. Yeah. Clearly. No, that's a good point. You mentioned rightly, uh, David, the cost, the $10,000 uh, sort of extreme example of a trust that you've seen before. So with that in mind, what is the, what, what is a, a, a realistic or measured baseline cost for creating a general common law trust? And what is the management fee for maintaining said trust? Wow. Um, well, they are all over the map. Um, okay. I have seen uh, junk trusts uh, that I, I wouldn't encourage my worst enemy to use for like $1,500. I've seen garbage trusts for $10,000. Um, I've seen people ask for thousands of dollars a year to sit as trustee, which is absurd. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I can't answer what like the going rate is for a trust because this isn't like going to the car lot and pricing cars, right? Right. Um, right. And and you're paying you're paying for expertise is really really what it comes down to. And oh my God, there's I hate to say this, but it it is the truth. So many people who are involved in the trust game, they're just out and out liars. Um, they'll tell you they're the God's gift to trusts and. Um, they're, they don't know what they're talking about. They're slinging crap. They're, they don't understand the fiduciary boundaries for trustees. Oh, just all sorts of horrible stuff. So you're paying for experience. You're paying for rectitude. You're paying for intelligence. You're paying for integrity. Um, I'm going to guess the going rate that's realistic, that you're, you know it's not junk and you're not getting ripped off, mm -hmm. probably somewhere in the range of four to $6,000. Okay. I think that's what most people need to get an idea of what's, what's reasonable, you know, yeah. to get for the and, proper expertise, you know? And so. I, I would say if a trustee is asking for anything more than a thousand dollars a year, and even that I, I'd be, huh, re really a <laughs> thousand. Um, but if anybody, if a trustee is asking for anything more than a thousand dollars, you're getting ripped off. Um, I I've seen trustee fees as low as $400 a year. I've seen them, you know, 800, 900, but if they're saying more than a thousand dollars, you're talking to a scam artist. Okay. Uh, unless there's something very unique about that trust that requires that trustee to be active week in and week out. I've never seen that, but then I could understand a higher fee. Fair enough. Well, that's a great follow-up question that I had for you, David, on what you just said. So with that in mind, what is the ideal criteria for selecting a common law trust expert? It's, I, I can give you the answer, but what I'm thinking in, the, in my head is yeah. how does the average Joe know, no. know that? So the answer is I've, I've mentioned it or hinted at it a couple of times. You want somebody who has experience. You want somebody who has rectitude. You want somebody who has character and integrity and experience and knowledge. Um, somebody who's intelligent, somebody who understands the law, somebody who understands trust law specifically. Okay. So why, why do people hire attorneys? They hire attorneys because they don't know anything about the law, right? So when you go to um, contract for a trustee, the, the average Joe who begins that process, how do they know anything about trust law? Mm -hmm. So, and, and as I indicated before, there's, there's such a huge percentage of people who are doing trusts that just either they think they know more than they do, um, which, which can harm somebody, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know what they don't know, or they're just scam artists. So first, let's take me as an example. We're sitting here talking. Sure. If, if, if somebody said, Dave, explain to me why you would make a good trustee. Okay. I could lay it out. But how would they know I'm not a lion sack of shit? So it's, it's challenging to find somebody um, who does possess all of those attributes. They have rectitude, they have knowledge, they have experience, they have honor, they have character, 
they understand law, law generally, they understand trust law specifically. So, you know, there's not a lot of those guys out there, which is why the community of trust providers mm-hmm. is such an ugly mess because most of them, they just got in it. A lot of them got in it just so they could make some money. Let's be plain about that. Sure. And even those that, that might've had a higher motivation, again, they don't know what they don't know. And that's dangerous. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not in the game anymore, but I'm hoping as an example through this interview, um, your audience would say, based on the knowledge that Dave has put out during this interview, I believe Dave would be a good trustee. Um, because we've had some time together and you've asked some very poignant questions. Um, and, and I hope that your audience, um, saw my responses as factual and legal and, and, and practical, um, right. how the, how, how it works. Um, but how do they judge somebody? Uh, they don't know. They haven't heard this kind of dialogue. Uh, how do they judge that? For instance, uh, I'm not going to name any names, but there was a person who was interviewed about trust law and he made the statement during the interview. Oh, the whole thing, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was, oh yeah, the whole thing about trusts is uh, you surrender your, your legal rights, uh, but you maintain your practical rights over the property. Okay. And uh, in a good many trusts, frankly, that's probably the game that the grantor is playing. Okay, let's be, let's be frank. In a good many trusts, that's the game that's being played. But for a guy who's creating trust, writing trust, serving as trustee, <laughs> to publicly come out and say that, what's going to happen if somebody challenges one of his trusts? Okay, right. <clears throat> somebody's going to bring into court his statement, and the judge is going to say, oh, so, so your trusts are basically a scam. Hmm. Um, so... You know, when I said a, a, a trustee should have rectitude, um, you should know when to keep his damn mouth shut. And, uh, uh, you know, for instance, you know, we've talked before the show. There, There's, you know, some people I'm in, not, I'm not involved with them. I know them. That's a better way to phrase it. I trust them implicitly, known them for decades. Um, and you probably know because you made an offer and he declined. <laughs> um, he has rectitude. He's not going out. He doesn't want to be in the public eye. He doesn't want everybody to know his name. He has rectitude. He's keeping he's keeping his community small, right? The people who need good common law trusts come to him. He doesn't need to be a superstar. He doesn't need to be a rock star. He doesn't need to be interviewed. He doesn't want everybody in the world knowing his name. He just wants to do his damn job. That's right. rectitude. Um, so, you know, again, back to your question. I don't know how they can know because they would have to know what the right answers are to know that they've got the right guy. And there's a lot of great bullshit artists out there. So how do people know they're getting bullshit? Well, I think that's why we brought you on to help kind of simplify and cut through that and give people some guide tools or navigations to at least know what to look for to get closer to that path point, you know? So And and the fact, hopefully the fact that I don't do trust anymore, Right. Um, happened, happened in years. Um, uh, hopefully that allows members of your audience to see more credibility because I have no dog in this fight. Sure. Yeah. I have no interest. That, My hands are clean. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it gives you, again, a level of when you work for your clients, a level of objectivity. You know, you had no dog in the fight and the judge saw that as well, which adds to credibility to give people that. Because what, what we're trying to do is create comfort and peace about this with the you know, upcoming reset that's happening. Uh, we've, we've had, you know, subject matter experts before, as you know, um, and, and people came away with more questions and answers. So I think your simplification of it and getting down to the marrow of it helps people to get a level of, you know, comfort and clarity that's desperately needed at this time, as you would agree. So the last question I have for today, Dave, because we're going to bring you back on next month to talk about you know, another popular subject of taxation and why it's not required and what you can do lawfully to, you know, subvert it and, and, and be in good standing. Um, but that's for the next show. Just I'm, I'm previewing for people that we, we are aware of that. We're going to be covering that with you summarily now that they're getting familiar with you. Um, again, this is a general guide, guide thing too, but uh, 
when somebody's building a trust and they, let's say they get two trustees, three trustees, and they get a managing director, as you said, to kind of have continuous oversight. Say somebody is single, they're not married, they don't have kids, but they're planning to have a family. And so they're gonna to need to amend that trust as they go along. How many meetings do you recommend that a person has? Is it per need or do you, do you recommend once a month just to keep things kind of open dialogue and make sure everybody's on the same page? What's your guide for that? There is no fixed number. Let me start with that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> especially in a common law trust. Some statutory trusts, there are statutory requirements. In a common law trust, there is no requirement. So um, meetings are... I don't want to say optional, because if there's something of, of uh, a, a momentous thing happening, there should be a meeting. Okay. Um, if, if the indenture specifies that meetings shall take place at particular moments, um, it can be based on calendar months, it can be based on events, it can be based on um, general need, okay, sort of an open-ended if the need arises. Uh, so, you, but you specifically talked about the fact that the unit certificate holders may not be the grantor's children, but the grantor intends to have a family. Okay? Mm -hmm. So in that eventuality, what should happen should be the unit certificate holder should be chosen very carefully, because here's why. The unit certificate holders can surrender their units. Okay. So for instance, let's say I wanted to start a family. I'm a little old for that, but <laughs> for the sake of this illustration. So I might choose um, one guy that I know has sterling character. I've known him my whole life, right? Like a brother to me. Okay, right. I want you to be the unit certificate holder. So he signs on. So then I get married a couple of years down the road. I have a kid. A couple of years later, I have another kid. A couple of years later, I have another kid. So now I have three children, right? So now I go back to him and I say, I would like you to surrender your units back to the trustee. Hmm. Okay. So he gets sent a document, he fills it out, notarizes it, and sends it back to the trustee, surrendering his units. The trustee then reassigns those units based on the information that was provided to the trustee at the time that the trust was formed. Okay? The trustee reassigns those units to the children of the grantor based on whatever percentage was discussed going in. Jay, I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, it doesn't have if you have three children, um, not not each of them doesn't have to receive 33 and a third units. Okay? Right. Um, it can be specified that that one child will receive 20 units and the other child will receive 50 units and the third child will receive 30 units because there's typically uh, 100 units and they, that can't be exceeded. Correct. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you clarified that because that's good for people to know. So again, thank you. Uh, so Dave, we're coming up to the end here. So as always, what we do with our guests that you'll learn is final words you have for the audience today and where can people find out about your work? Okay, final words to the audience. Um, don't get taken. It, it's, it's an ugly scene out there when it comes to common law trust. Please do your due diligence. Don't get taken. Um, and, and Try if, if there's some other source you can get information, please do not believe the trust creator. They have a financial interest in getting you to believe whatever they say. Okay. Um, so that that is inherently a conflict of interest going in. Okay? Uh, so if there's any other source from which you can get information to verify or not what they're saying, try and find that source. Um, if I could be of any assistance, people can reach me at my email address, which is Dave at drreality.news. That's Dave at drreality.news so they can reach me there anytime um anything else that you I, I wish i had great words of wisdom um you know again i guess i would say if you're in some sort of regulated industry depends on what regulated industry but if you're in some sort of regulated industry uh, perhaps a common law trust is not for you um and by the way, I should also point out, you know, I think one of the advantages that people see of a common law trust is they're they're free and clear of the income tax system. Okay. And that's only true if the activities of the trust don't fall within the boundaries of income tax law, which is probably 99.99999% of the time. Nevertheless, um, this, the same is true of an LLC. Um, an LLC that doesn't engage in the very narrow scope of activities upon which Congress has opposed the income tax, they're also free of the income tax. Um, 
So again, you know, somebody tells me they're running a shoe shop. Okay. Common law trust might be right or running it in their own name might be right. If they're running, um, I don't know, uh, uh, what do they call it? The people who like clean up your yard and they do golf courses and stuff. Uh, oh, landscape. What are they? And- landscape. Yeah. So if somebody owns a large landscaping business and they've got a lot of power tools and trucks out there and a lot of workers. Okay. So common law trust might be really, really good for them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if they're engaged in the manufacturing of ammunition, eh, don't go with a common law trust. So uh, yeah, just yeah, again, if I can be of assistance, people can reach out. Yeah, and we'll leave all those links in the description so people can get a hold of you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next month on the tax subject of taxation, which is a great segue point. So again, Dave Champion, thank you for being here. We're honored to have you. And thank you for all the information you provided. And we will look forward to seeing you again shortly. Thanks, Sean. Take care.